This episode is proudly supported by Open Table. Nearly one third of diners are booking same day. So they're making those decisions on the spot. And 10% are, do- are making their bookings within just a few hours. And so it's why it's so important to have you know, booking software like Open Table, which allows your diners to discover you. And so when restaurants are on platforms like Open Table, they're much more likely to be discovered. We help diners to connect to restaurants. Ultimately, having technology, using technology, helps you to reattach to those diners. Experience the power of Open Table. For an exclusive offer, visit restaurant.opentable.com.au forward slash DITW. You pretty much get what you put into it, which is daunting, but it's also, I mean, it's like magical. That's like the sweet spot. That's where a lot of really good things come from. With fishing, it's like if, like, I don't have to go every day. I choose to go every day. I don't have to be there first thing in the morning. I'm choosing to be there first thing in the morning. Um, And there's something really nice about that. This is Fish Tales, a seafood podcast. I'm John Sussman. Ask any outsider what Maine brings to mind, and the response might well be bone-chilling winters, forests, moose, quaint fishing villages along a rocky coast. Perhaps flannel shirts and hiking boots, and of course lobsters. Lots of lobsters. The American lobster, Omaris americanus, is found on the east coast of North America from Newfoundland in the north to North Carolina in the south. The tiny northeastern U.S. state of Maine is the powerhouse of not only U.S., but world lobster production. The lobster catch in 2020 was a massive 54,000 tonnes, with a value of over 490 million U.S. dollars, making it not only the world's largest lobster fishery, but one of the single largest commercial fisheries. The Maine lobster fishery is also fiercely competitive with many intergenerational fishers jealously guarding their fishing rights and areas. It's no place for the faint-hearted or those afraid of hard work. 30-year-old Sadie Samuels was never going to be anything but a lobster fisherman, but her rare drive, enthusiasm and love of the lobster makes her a unique species in this incredible fishery. My name is Sadie Samuels and I live in um, Searsmont, Maine, USA. Pretty much I live in the, the woods, basically the middle of nowhere, but there's still some stuff around. <laughs> but um, I live 20 minutes away from the harbor that I fish out of, that I've been fishing out of my whole life, which is Rockport Harbor. Um, and then it's also 20 minutes from the other coastal town that I have my food cart and kind of lobster food business in, which is Belfast. Like all of my good memories as a kid were fishing um, I mean, my, the way my dad puts it was that I was born at the, in the Rockport Hospital and before I even went home, they brought me down to the harbor first to like meet everyone and go on the boat. So, um, you know, I have like super early memories of like playing with lobsters and starfish on the boat and stuff like that. I really couldn't even put an age to it. They're like, whenever I first started like realizing things, I was like, oh, that's cool. Oh my God, can I touch that? What's that? So my family has been, well, basically my dad's the first in my family to have gotten into fishing. Um, and when he, he got into fishing when he was about 15 or 16, um, he moved to Maine from New York, uh, Long Island, and he pretty much got a job on a boat and never, ever left. So for me... Um, I'm the first of his kids and, um, pretty much when I was born, it was, you know, being in a fishing family, that's just all you do. So my dad provided for us through lobstering, um, and doing a couple other things. He used to do, um, urchin fishing and we still do some halibut fishing and stuff like that. But, um, but yeah, he pretty much worked from sunrise to sunset as, you know, most fishermen do. So when I was a little kid, I just was, I just wanted to be with him and go do the stuff with him all the time. Um, so yeah, my mom was pretty much a stay at home mom, took care of all of us. And my dad just like fished and fished and hunted and all of that. Um, and actually his, 
his family is interesting. They're pretty much a bunch of lawyers and, you know, doctors and stuff like that. And uh, he was just like, nope. He's like, I want to go fishing. <laughs> so, um, yeah, he, he always jokes that he's the black sheep of the family. But my grandparents always laughed that he was, you know, one of the happiest. <laughs> Typical teen behaviour includes a focus on friends and a desire to be independent of the family, to be one's own person, often resenting any input or advice from parents. Careers are rarely considered, let alone developed. For Sadie Samuels, growing up with a love of her family business, the sea and fishing, meant her teen years were spent honing her skills and building a career. When I when I was really young, I... Um... Yeah, I really, I kind of just wanted to be on the boat as much as I could. Um, so when I, before I started school, um, I would go in the, like, my dad would be able to take me out in the summers um, when the weather was pretty good and stuff like that. He never, he wouldn't take me out when I was like a baby, when it was really rough or anything, obviously. But um, after that, um, so I was seven when I was seven years old, I got my student commercial, or not my student commercial license. It's just called a student license. Um, and so pretty much once I got that, I would go fishing with my dad a couple times a week, every single week through the whole summer. Um, and the way that kind of works is that, so each boat has X amount of tags on it. So from so by me getting a student license, my dad had to give up a couple of his tags to allow me to, you know, try to fish. Um, and yeah, the, I mean, he basically just says that every day after school or anytime I could get a ride down there, I was just there. And then he realized that it was going to start cutting into his gear. Um, so when I was 14, I got my own boat. Um and that was like a, a small little seaway with a little 88 Evinrude outboard. Um, and I could fit maybe like three or four traps on it. But I would just ride down like any days we had off from school. I would just ride down with my dad in the morning and go, um, you know, go out with him for the day a lot of times. And then he'd go out with me afterwards and help me tend my traps. Um, and yeah, I just kind of did that for a while um, after school or definitely like mostly in, in the summer, like when I, when I was off of school, um, because otherwise my dad was already down there and I couldn't get a ride. But, um, then my little sister, Molly, who's four years younger than me, she started getting into it. And when I was about, gosh, I think I was like 17 or I had just gone to college. So yeah, I think I was 17. Um, she actually found the boat that I fish now and her and I bought that together. But basically my dad was kind of like, okay, I can tell this is something you guys are actually wanting to do. So you're going to have to like, he kind of kicked us out of the nest type of thing. <laughs> He's like, okay, you need to get your own boat and start figuring this out on your own. Like I was, I, it was really exciting. I mean, he was excited about the whole thing, but you know, he was kind of like, I didn't really, I don't think anyone expected me to to like it as much as I have. <laughs> Whilst most entrepreneurial ventures start out as a small business, not all small businesses are entrepreneurial and very few succeed on the first go. Vision, commitment, passion and skill are needed in bucket loads. Going it alone in a startup fishing business is difficult for a seasoned, mature and experienced fisherman, let alone for a teenager. Well, breaking out on my own was interesting as as it always is. <laughs> um, learning to really be your own captain and stuff, I feel like that's a constant learning curve. Um, you know, that's what makes it, makes it really exciting is, I mean, I pretty much could do this for the rest of my life and I'll still never be the best or know everything. But uh, yeah, the first few years were the biggest learning curve. <laughs> um, you know, it was, it was really hard in the beginning because I didn't have enough gear to have um, like a real crew or anything so I had to kind of piece it together and go when I could go when I could find people to go with me um uh, one one of the things that was kind of funny it was my, my dad's always been super supportive but when I got my own boat there was a point where um him and a lot of the other guys in the harbor they just had this tendency of like doing things for me and I hated it I mean I appreciated it but I also kind of hated it 
because in my mind, I was like, I want to do this forever and I want to be just like you guys. So I need to know how you did that. And if you do it for me, I'll never figure that out. So at one point, I kind of had a meltdown, <laughs> not like a meltdown, but I kind of flipped out at everyone. I was like, you know, get off my boat. If you're not going to show me how to do it, then I don't have any use for you. Blah, 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 blah. It was bad. Um, but from then on, everything kind of went a lot better. Um, because then people would show, like, I could ask questions and I was more shown how to do things rather than people doing them for me. And it took me a little while to figure that out, you know, cause it's like, people are being kind and helping you, but if you really want to do it, you do need to figure it out yourself. And I just kind of kept saying that I'm like, I'm going to go out, I'm going out by myself or with somebody who doesn't know what they're doing. I need to know what's happening. Rockport, Maine is a coastal village with a mere 3,300 residents with only 20% of the population under the age of 44. Regarded as a quaint artist's colony, it is also the home port for Sadie Samuel's lobster fishing business. Here in Maine, it is uh, lobstering is a year-round fishery, but it, it's completely different, kind of different parts of the state. Um, like my harbor specifically freezes over, um, tends to be in like mid to late December. Um, and so most of the guys, around me and most of the guys kind of inshore fishing tend to start in may ish april may and then end kind of mid-december rockport maine is a really really small little port um it's actually i mean i'm super biased but i love it to death it's just a cute little kind of like hidden harbor it seems like in between two other bigger harbors but I mean, I guess keep in mind that everything in Maine is pretty small. So, um, like, even a big harbor is pretty small. <laughs> but um, but Rockport's really cool. We've got a fleet of about 12 commercial boats, commercial lobster fishing boats. Um, and on kind of on our side, on the commercial side, there's also um, Rockport Marine, which is a world-renowned wooden boat building facility so it's almost like we get to look at the most beautiful boats ever like they have them all moored out in the moorings like beyond our boats so it's kind of like um you're going through like a boat gallery <laughs> which i really enjoy <laughs> fishermen often have a special platonic friendship with their work colleagues characterized by a close emotional bond high levels of disclosure and support and mutual trust honesty loyalty and respect it's part of needing to have absolute confidence that your crew have your back when you're out on the high seas. Husband and wife teams in family fishing enterprises aren't especially rare. However, it's not often that the female is the boss. So my my current boat is a 28 foot Novi Rossboro, um, and I've got a 115 John Deere in it, which is small, but um, but it's a really good really good engine and a really good boat. Um, I have the smallest boat in, in my fleet, but I'm also the youngest person in my fleet. So I know I know all of them had smaller boats when they were my age. So I don't feel anything about that. But um, but yeah, so it's pretty much it's a classic Novi hull. So it's got kind of like a higher bow and um, the main lobster boats um, are pretty much just work boats like with a cabin. Um, they're really beautiful, but they take the sea pretty well. And um, yeah, and uh, they're, you know, they're beautiful, but they're beat up. Like my boat is, <laughs> my boat takes, um, takes a lot of abuse. And so I guess that brings me to the kind of gear that we use. Um, we use big wire mesh traps, typically about four feet long. Um, and where we are like where i am inshore um i we tend to only put like one or two traps on a line three maximum is the limit for inshore but offshore they'll put like huge like 10 20 trap trawls um but yeah we i use a um, hydraulic hoist and ho like you know they all have a buoy at the end and I have to go gaff all the buoys, put it up through the hoist, turn the hydraulics on, rip them up from the bottom. Um, yeah, lots of wear and tear, but 
it's good. So my crew is, um, I have a stern man and a third man. And my stern man is actually my boyfriend also. Um, I try to say, I try to, he and I do a pretty good job of like separating, uh, you know, business and our relationship. And I try really hard to point out that he's my stern man before I tell anyone he's my boyfriend, because it tends to be that like, everyone's like, oh yeah, well he just does everything, (laughs) which is not true. (laughs) um but he i met him in the bahamas and he was a full-time commercial fisherman down there um and he ended up coming up here and i needed some crew so he and i've actually been working together now for six years i think it is definitely a solid five um and then and we just we work really great together we both love fishing so much so it's actually like the greatest possible partnership um but it is, it is pretty funny spending that much time with your significant other. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I've actually taken on, I've trained quite a few people how to lobster. Um, and currently I have a third man who is from Texas who's never fished before. So that's pretty fun. It's certainly not a life for everyone. Long hours, hard work and bad weather are enough to keep most people on land. But if you ask commercial fishermen about fishing for a living, They'll tell you a different story. They'll tell you about the breathtaking beauty of the open ocean, about the great excitement of a good catch, and about the personal satisfaction of a hard day's work. While many fishermen admit that fishing can exact a physical and emotional toll, it's a small price to pay for a way of life that keeps them coming back season after season to earn a living from the sea. A typical day for me at work would be um, waking up. so. We pretty much try to leave the dock uh, like right at sunrise or just before sunrise. But um, here in Maine, the light changes a lot throughout the season. Um, Like right now, it's not it doesn't really get light until like 645. But in the beginning of the season, it'll get light at like four, you know, four or 445. So beginning of the season, I get up at around three and then I'm down there try to be off the dock by like 4 45 5 o'clock kind of sometime we gotta you have to wait in line for bait and all of that so i'll go down get the boat get bait get my crew um and then we'll head out and then we typically haul uh like around 250 260 pots a day and then um and that takes like six to eight hours kind of depending and then you come back in and we have it pretty good. Um, my buyer also sells us bait and fuel in the mornings. And then um, we have this commitment that they sell us that stuff and then we'll sell them our lobsters. So they'll, they'll take whatever we come in with. Any amount, which is awesome. So typically I will, um, like I'm the captain, so I'll drive the boat up to the first buoy they all are set in what i call slash we call strings um which is just like sets of traps basically (laughs) um and so i'll do five pairs in a string so i'll have 10 traps in a string say so i'll go up to the first buoy i'll gaff the buoy i'll put the line in the hauler pull the trap the first trap up my stern man will grab that trap. Then we'll pull the second trap up and my stern man and third will be picking the first, the first trap that came up. And so they'll pick out all the crabs, all the lobsters, um, all that, any bycatch, like sometimes we'll catch a little fish or starfish or I don't know, all sorts of weird things. But so they'll pick it clean, rebate it and then get it ready to set. Well, uh, and then the, the, trap that's by me um, my stern man will bait that and pick that but I'll pick out the lobsters Um, and then as soon as I'm done picking out the lobsters I get the boat ready to set them and then go to the next one and so you kind of just do that until you get done Um, so with my license the maximum you can have with a a commercial lobster license in the state of Maine is 800 traps so um so you just divide your 800 traps into three days, typically, um, and then you take one day off. So you tend all your gear within three days. Um, so 
basically it's all it's kind of like a set maze <laughs> Vertical integration, by definition, is the combination in one company of two or more stages of production normally operated by separate companies. Whilst Maine Lobster is the backbone of the state's economy, the Maine Lobster role is perhaps the culinary icon for which the state is known. To be both catcher and cook requires rare and special skills and, of course, an absolute love of lobster. When I started commercially lobstering, um, since I started with a student license, I was not able to fish full time. Um, and coming from kind of like a fishing family, um, kind of having downtime didn't sit right with me. And I knew I really wanted to fish full time. So I started um, selling lobsters at a farmer's market on the weekends, on Saturdays. Um, and it was kind of funny. I, I did it because I'm like, well, I know I have really good lobster. And this is a way for me to kind of meet people that I don't, that maybe would never talk to a fisherman type of thing. Um, and it really opened a whole lot of interesting avenues for me. Um, so I started selling the lob just live lobster. Um, and then I went to a different farmer's market um, in Belfast here. And I did the indoor an indoor farmer's market. And through that, the guy in charge of that market kind of threw this idea out to me like, well, why don't you try doing lobster rolls? And again, I was not fishing full time at this time. Um, I was really only able to fish like three days a week, which so I was like, oh, yeah, I've got pl I've got plenty of time. I'll figure that all out. And I'd also been kind of talking about it since I was a little kid kind of just telling everyone like, oh, well, you should have my lobster roll. Well, you should try my lobster roll. Um, and it's just, it's just kind of interesting to think back on it because I kind of have always been obsessed with like the quality of seafood and the quality of the seafood everyone's eating around me. And I used to like quiz people like, well, do you know where that came from? Who caught that? Like, or I would try their lobster rolls and I'd be like, there's something about this. I don't, it's just not like my lobster roll. I don't know what, what it is. So anyway, I had this little opportunity come up and I was like, challenge accepted. So I started, you know, I went through all the going from lobstering to learning how to run a kitchen is completely crazy. Um, so that was a huge learning curve. <laughs> um, but once I got through that and I started selling my lobster rolls um, and picked meat at the farmer's market, people were just going nuts for it. I mean, I sold out every single week almost. It was crazy. So then I, like a couple years, I guess I was doing that for three years um, and people just wanted more and more and more from me. And I was like, well, how can I make that happen? I only do this on Saturdays at the farmer's market. Like, how could I give the people what they want? So um, I ended up finding a food cart that I didn't really know anything about but it looked like the right thing. And I don't know. So I bought it. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, next thing I knew, I was running a food cart seven days a week while also fishing full time. Um, but it's nuts because really it's been because of my customers have wanted it so much. Like I didn't even advertise or anything until this last, this last season. And uh, yeah, and a lot of the push for me to grow and do the things I've been doing is because people have been, you know, people have been asking me for it. And I guess for me, the biggest thing was that, um, like my whole life revolves around the quality of my seafood and the fact that people agree, like, you know, were telling me that it's the best seafood they ever had. I'm like, Oh my, like, you're just fanning the flames. Oh my God. <laughs> Tell me more. My lobster roll is what I call a classic Maine fisherman lobster roll. It's a Frankfurter bun with uh, tons of butter on it, toasted. Um, and the Frankfurter, I also recently learned, is a main thing. So it's like a hot dog bun with the sides cut off. I don't know. I was recently told that they don't exist many other places. <laughs> but they're perfect for toasting with butter. Um, and then I have, you know, fresh lobster that I caught that... Um, I mix with like super light mayo, squeeze the lemon, put that in. I put 
you know, a heaping four ounces in it. So it's pretty much just lobster. And then I put chives on top. And that is the whole lobster roll. The main lobster fishery is one of the world's most successful fisheries. For over 150 years, the Maine lobster fishery has been defined by its commitment to fishing sustainably, with many of its practices created by fishermen and self-policed. This commitment to sustainability is the driving force of the entire industry. The future of lobstering in Maine is complicated, um, but I guess that's just how, you know, that's how it is everywhere. Um, But I see... The older I get, the more I see that my role in it is to talk to people is to like let people know what we're about and show you know i around here there's like a lot of people who aren't at all involved in the community have like a caricature of what a lobster fisherman is or of a fisherman in general and it's not true it's just not true like and i i don't know there's something that just really really tickles me when i can have a conversation with someone and they're just like oh my gosh I had no idea like that a woman could do this or I had no idea that, you know, you guys cared about the environment so much. I had no idea all of these things. So for me, that stuff just, I don't know. It's like definitely gets me out of bed every single day. It keeps me answering emails. It keeps me, I mean, keeps me talking to people on the docks. I am very lucky to have a lot of people who believe in me. Um, I think the funniest thing I get asked is how do you do this all on your own? And I think the thing is that I really haven't, um, you know, I've always been a big ideas person and a pretty, um, I guess I've been kind of like aggressive towards my dreams and goals in a way, but, um, somehow I've convinced quite a few people that they were good ideas. And, uh, yeah, I've got for the food cart side, I've got like a whole entire employee crew. I've got like full-time employees. I have a secretary now. I've got the whole nine yards. <laughs> but lobstering, I I pers- like I have to be there and I want to be there. That's what that's what I more so do the day to day of. There's a lot of freedom that comes from being a you know commercial fisherman or an entrepreneur. Um, that I think. You know, it's something you kind of have to fight for and it feels intense sometimes, but other times it really is the most freeing feeling on the planet. Um, You know, it's pretty, you pretty much get what you put into it, which is daunting, but it's also, I mean, it's like magical. That's like the sweet spot. That's where a lot of really good things come from. Um, You know, with with fishing, it's like if, like, I don't have to go every day. I choose to go every day. I don't have to be there first thing in the morning. I'm choosing to be there first thing in the morning. Um, And there's something really nice about that. My future is definitely going to be a whole lot more fishing, probably a whole lot more seafood. And yeah, I'm pretty lucky. I really like what I do. In my 30 years of working with, in and around fishers, Sadie Samuels is one of the most inspiring I've met. Her enthusiasm, commitment and absolute love of her region, her profession and of course her lobsters makes her a true star of the sea. With the next generation of fishers, like Sadie Samuels, committed to best practice catching and maximising the value of every lobster they catch, the future of the main lobster fishery looks bright. This is Fish Tales, a seafood podcast. A Deep in the Weeds production, I'm John Sussman. Follow us on Instagram at Fishtales Seafood Podcast or email us at fishtalespodcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay tuned for more tales from beneath the surface of the seafood world every Friday on your podcast app.